morning. Let me get my lights here. All right. Uh, before we get started, do any of you have any questions? I'm sure that you spent the entire week thinking about the Sistine Chapel and Luther's reaction. And probably something popped into your mind. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 That, that, the, um, one of the most remarkable things is that before the Reformation, the, the, the church was in fact very open to all sorts of, uh, how do I put this? Um, there were certain things that you had to do in order to be a Christian. You, you had to go to Mass, and you had to say confession and, and do penance, and you had to know the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, and the Ave Maria, and the Creed. And if you did that, you were good to go. And whatever else you did, they were pretty much okay with that. And, and, and what we find is that this is a period from around 1480 down to about 15, the old name of the Council of Trent, 1546, where you find really this receptiveness to things like the symbols on the Sistine Chapel scene. It really is remarkable. So, just quickly, what was the role of women like before the Reformation and after? Did that change at all? Or the, the role of women? The role of women in the church. We're going to have a whole other class on that. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just, it's, it's, it's a huge topic, okay? Yeah. It really is a huge topic. Um, yeah, there, um, yeah, I just can't remember that. <laughs> it just goes on forever. All right. Uh, any other questions that anyone might have? Okay. Uh, by way of uh, introduction here, I, I just want to briefly recap once again. Uh, we started by talking about, first of all, we talked about prophets and symbols, and then we started talking about uh, the nine panels that Michelangelo painted on the Sistine Chapel ceiling itself. Um, and I, I did point out to you that he, uh, the, the, the ceremonial entrance to the Sistine Chapel is down on this end. This is the west end. This is where the Pope and the papal court came in. And they would march through the Sistine Chapel down to this end where the high altar is. Uh, and it's also interesting that Michelangelo actually starts painting down on this and he starts with the scenes of Noah and then he works his way down to the high altar and it's, it's sort of counterintuitive because uh, as someone pointed out last week, you start from the, you know, the, the, this chronologically, you start from the wrong, uh, wrong end and work your way down here. Um, I try to point out, and I'm not quite sure about this, but I, I, I just think it would have been disconcerting to have um, uh, Noah and the destruction of mankind down here by the high altar. Uh, I, I just think in terms of um, the, what they're trying to do with the idea of salvation coming from uh, the sacrifice of Christ, beginning here, perfection down here with uh, uh, the, the creation of God and then the high altar below that, I think that that's probably the sensitivity that they had in mind when they decided uh, what chronological order they were going to paint the, the, the ceiling in. All right, uh, just a brief recap. Uh, we talked about uh, creation and the way that uh, uh, Michelangelo had decided to capture uh, God uh, uh, creating on day one, uh, the first fresco of God separating light from darkness. And I pointed out to you, uh, that Luther would have approved of this image, uh, God creating on the first day, because there was at the time uh, when Luther's writing in, in as uh, Michelangelo is conceptualizing what he's going to put on the ceiling, and theologians, uh, and I, I made this point last week, that there's probably a, a, a theologian at the papal court who's helping Michelangelo along. Uh, they simply didn't tell Michelangelo just to just go out and paint the ceiling, uh, because there are certain um, uh, points that they wanted to make. And there was a huge issue that was being argued in uh, universities, uh, whether uh, God actually had created the world, God had actually created the universe. And there was a, a, a lot of opposition to the idea that uh, the world had been created by God, uh, simply because it wasn't logical and it, it didn't make sense. And they're relying upon Aristotle, this ancient natural philosopher who argued against creation. And Luther in his commentary, again and again and again, uh, draws points from the creation story of uh, Genesis, saying that this demonstrates that God, uh, God did in fact create. And I think you would have been very pleased by this first resto right here, showing God in the uh, process of creating on the first day, and God separating light from, uh, from dark. At the same time, 
I pointed out to you, and I think that this is something that, uh, uh, particularly in those first four or five frescoes, would have bothered uh, Luther an awful lot, and that is the manner in which Michelangelo depicted God creating. Um, Michelangelo has God being very active. He's a hands-on creator. He's physically out there ordering things around, and he's bringing order out of chaos. And he, uh, you know, he points in this direction, and the sun is created, and he points in this direction, and the moon is created. This would have bothered Luther uh, because it went against one of his major theological points that he tries to make uh, in his uh, annotations on Genesis, which is that God created by speaking, right? And God said, and he equates this God using the spoken word, uh, the variable of the spoken word uh, to Christ himself, that, that, the, that Christ is the word incarnate. And he argues then that, that God creates through Christ himself. And I, I think uh, Michelangelo would have been bothered by this. I, uh, in, in deference to, or Luther would have been bothered by this, in deference to Michelangelo, I think we would have lost an awful lot if he had done that. <laughs> you know, there's something almost majestic about the way that God has shown creating. And, it, and there's a reason that, this is, uh, uh, that these frescoes are famous, and that's because of the, the power, the awesomeness that Michelangelo has given to God. But I think in doing that, he's fulfilling an objective of the papal court, and they want an overpowering almighty God, a God who, in fact, is going to become very angry uh, when Adam and Eve uh, uh, destroy this perfect creation. All right, so we already talked about that. Uh, let me see right here. Yes, okay. Uh, Luther's, any, any questions over that? I just want to briefly recap that to, uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, this is a little bit too soon because Michelangelo is painting from 1508 to, uh, to okay. 1512, and Luther really doesn't start to challenge a church until 1517. Okay. So it, it, it comes yeah. just a, a few years before that. Yeah. Until I started reading yeah, uh, I will say this, that um, if, if, if we take a look at the, uh, the resurrection of the dead, the final fresco that, that uh, Michelangelo paints, and he's painting that in 1534, 1535, you can, in fact, see echoes of the, you know, the, the people stand against the Reformation there. But in these early frescoes, no. All right, uh, so, and, and then quickly moving on, so this is the uh, first fresco, the second fresco right here, this one, the second fresco, God creating the earth and the sun and the moon, and you have to understand here that what Michelangelo has done is he is combining two days of creation in one fresco. On the left-hand side, um, we're looking at the derriere of God, I mean, no disrespect to that, but there it is, and you can see uh, that he has created earth, right? Uh, that earth is uh, created on day three. And then over here on the right-hand side, you can see this majestic and awesome God who looks an awful lot like, uh, I, I don't know, uh, just this overpowering God um, uh, creating the sun, gesturing over here. The sun is created and the moon is being created over here. All right. Uh, my sense is that Michelangelo would have objected to this fresco on a couple of grounds. First of all, and this is probably the thing that would have bothered him an awful lot, and that is, uh, it is out of order. <laughs> it's simply out of order. He, he shows creation on day one. Um, right here, you can see this happens on day one. God is separating the light from the darkness. And then he jumps ahead to depict on the next, uh, the next panel, he depicts days uh, three and four of creation. And this would have bothered uh, uh, Luther an awful lot. Uh, uh, what, uh, what we were told is, that uh, on day three, God gathers the waters together so that the dry earth could appear. You see, this is what's happening over here on the left-hand side, that God has gathered uh, the misty waters together, and because he has congregated the waters, then the earth can rise up from where the waters had covered them. Luther would have schooled Michelangelo on this, pointing out to him that this could only take place after the actions that God took on day two of creation, because on day two of creation, God had put a, what, what, what uh, Moses calls a, or the writer of Genesis calls a firmament. Uh, that is this band, this hard band up into the sky. And this firmament bottled up most of the waters above it. It pushed the waters above it. And there's this huge body of water, according to Genesis, above the firmament. 
And what was left below then was a remnant, or as Luther in his commentary calls them, dregs, right? We have these dregs of water. There's still a lot of water, but not nearly as much water as there was before. And it was these dregs that are left underneath the firmament that God then gathered in the seas and oceans on day three, allowing the dry earth to emerge. So Luther would have been bothered by this. He would have just said, this is not the way that God created. And although God could have done this, this is not what God did. It's not according to the text. Okay, so Michelangelo, in fact, depicts the creation of the firmament. And you can see it right there. But this is the third fresco. It's out of order. It should be right here, and then this fresco should follow that right there. Okay, have any questions over this? Why did Michelangelo do that? That's just a question I want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not for you, Barbara. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, and uh, I, it, we don't have um, any writings or any instructions from Michelangelo or, or ruminations on why he did this, so we're not sure. But my sense is, and this is, he's, he's got um, uh, two sets of frescoes out of order. And uh, the, the first one is right here. You can see the first two, and then the third one, uh, number three should actually be number two, and number two should be actually number three. And then when we get down here to the Moses cycle, uh, he starts out with a sacrifice of Moses, or a sacrifice of Noah. This is this panel right here. And then we've got the flood, and then we've got the drunkenness of Noah. But as all of you biblical scholars know, Noah did not make a sacrifice until after he had left the ark. That is, until after the flood is over. So we have another set of panels which is out of order down here as well. The only explanation that I can come up with, and I think that art historians would probably agree with me, is that if you look at what he's working with, we have a small panel, large panel, small panel, large panel. I'm talking about the terms uh, in terms of the space he has to paint. Can you follow that up there? Small, large, small, large, small, large. And I think when Michelangelo is looking at this right here, I'm thinking what he says is, if I put uh, God uh, uh, putting the firmament in the heavens in this big panel right here, I'm going to have a lot of wasted space. Right? I'm going to have a lot of wasted space. And he's thinking that if I do number days number three and four here, they seem to work really well together. I can get a lot more bang for my buck if I put them in that large panel than if I put them in that small panel uh, because it's simply going to be too crowded down here. And that's the only reason I can come up with why he would have done that. Right? Just in terms of, of, uh, of artistic style and giving him the room that he needed to do what he wanted, it just seems to work better for him to put days three and four in that larger panel. That's the only thing I can come up with. Right? Yeah. Okay. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't go see these. They're still good. You just need to know that they're, they're a little confusing. <laughs> don't, don't have the book of Genesis in front of you trying to make sense out of what's up there because you'll get confused. It doesn't work that way. Okay. Uh, let me see. Where are we right here? Yeah. Okay. Overview. Let's go back. Okay, uh, so he would have uh, objected to this fresco uh, 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 because it's out of order, but also, and I mentioned this last week, he would have objected, I think, very much, uh, well, uh, uh, let, let me say one more thing. Um, in, in the creation on day three right here, you can see the earth, uh, and it's, uh, it, it's, it, it's round, and you can see there's vegetation coming out of it. When you read Luther's commentary on Genesis, he spends a lot of time talking about God as a... A, a, a generous, a, a beneficent benefactor, God who in fact, and this is how he describes it, he said, um, God is a father who's creating a home for Adam and Eve, that is for the first man and woman. And he takes elaborate care, that is God, in preparing his home for Adam and Eve. And Luther spends a lot of time talking about the vegetation and the animals and how God just gets everything perfect because his God is a very loving and a very kind God. And I think it would have bothered him that uh, Michelangelo has just given short shrift to that. All you get is just a little patch of green over here. I think he would have liked to have seen more of God's beneficence towards uh, man and uh, mankind in creating the earth. Okay, moving over here then to day four. And I said this before, and you can see that uh, on day four, God then, he's already created the heavens, but now he's going back and he's putting uh, the sun and the moon and the planets and the stars up in the heaven. And this, of course, is a very, very powerful scene. 
Um, and I think that Michelangelo uh, probably would have uh, bothered, Michelangelo's depiction of God would have bothered Luther here because of, uh, uh, simply he is a very, very overpowering, almost uh, a foreboding God. If you look at him, he's, he's, it's like he's scowling, right? He's stern and he's all powerful. And I, I said this last week that um, this is not Luther's God. You know, Luther's God is a much kinder, much more gentle God, and I think that that would have bothered this depiction of God, although it's very powerful, uh, I, I think it would have bothered Luther an awful lot. He would have liked to have seen a more gentle and a more kind God as well. Uh, this doesn't appear to be a God of mercy. You can just imagine the reaction of this God when Adam and Eve sin against him and his perfection. He's going to be very, very angry. Yes, question? Yeah, those people, uh, no, he's not running a daycare center because that's what it looks like, actually. Those are angels, right? Those are puti. Those are angels that are accompanying God as he's uh, in, in, in the process of creation. Yeah. Uh, that also would have bothered uh, Luther because uh, Luther makes the argument, and, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, uh, that God works through uh, Christ and he works through the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, when he's creating. Uh, and I think that uh, Luther would have much preferred somehow to get that image up there rather than those Putin, but, but there they are. Any other questions, Kevin, Sonia? Do they always think of God as some sort of superhuman? <clears throat> yeah, he's anthrop anthropomorphic. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and but in, but the books look human? I mean, I, I never knew about that way, but they, they must have. Yeah, this is what they, they, they see him as uh, uh, a very, he's a very, very um, powerful patriarchal figure uh, with a long beard and, and, and features that are very awesome. I mean, this goes all the way back. If you, if you look at uh, Roman sculpture of Jupiter, for instance, Jupiter has many of these same characteristics as well. Just a, a superhuman uh, a, a human being, yeah, but always in an anthropological fashion like this. Well, the reason for this is, and if you follow their reasoning, this is biblical. Because man is created in God's image and likeness. And what does a man look like? I mean, a man looks like that. But, but then it's not just an ordinary man. It's got to be, you know, a, a grander and more divine than that. So that's why they do this. All right. So, uh, so much for uh, uh, these frescoes. The, 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 uh, the first fresco and the second fresco. Let's move on to the third fresco, which you know by now is uh, out of order. But let's just let that um, um, uh, pass. All right. Uh, what is Luther's reaction to the third fresco right here? And, uh, and, and, and here, here's a text that uh, Michelangelo is working from Genesis chapter one, verse six. God said. Let there be a firmament in the middle of the waters, and let it divide waters from waters. Uh, this is a little bit hard for us to wrap our minds around, because this is not how we think of the cosmos, and this is not how we think of heaven. But um, this was common. This is uh, uh, and, and, um, uh, ancient science, ancient natural philosophy. Uh, the Greeks and the Romans had actually had something sim similar to this, where they believed that the earth itself uh, was in fact encapsulated in a hard crystal dome, uh, and that uh, uh, the, the, the planets, uh, the planets and the sun and the moon were attached to that dome, and that they moved around that dome itself. That there was a hard dome out there. And this has all sorts of consequences to begin with. It means that the universe is finite, uh, and it also means that uh, you have to somehow you have to come up with a physics which is going to encapsulate motion with this dome. Uh, but for now, let's get back to the Mosaic account right here. And what, uh, what Moses is saying, well, let's, uh, uh, let's listen to uh, Luther's thoughts on this passage. And I think I've got the text right here. Yeah, let there be a firmament in the middle of the waters and let it divide water from waters. Okay, so here's what Luther says. God sees this unformed mass of mist. Okay, so remember on the first day, God created heaven and earth. Uh, and, and, and Luther and others at the time understood heaven to be water, right? That this is one of the elements, one of the prim primordial elements that God is going to use to help create earth and water. And they believe then that that heaven is a watery mist. 
Okay, so God sees, now this is on day two. God has created day one. He's created the elements. He's created earth and water. And on day two, God then is going to use that water to create. God sees this unformed mass of mist in the word. That is, he's using Christ, the miracle. He's going to use that, and through Christ, he's going to create. And he gives the command that it should extend itself outward in the manner of a sphere, right? So this is what he's doing. He's creating that hard, crystalline dome. The heaven was made in this manner that the unformed mass ex uh, extended itself outward as a bladder of a pig extends itself outward in circular form when it is inflated. God, I love that imagery. Isn't that great? You can see Luther as he's seen sausage being made for has He it really has, right? It's uh, stuffing the bladder of a pig um, and, and making sausage. Okay, he further explained this text. But what is most remarkable is that Moses clearly makes three divisions. He places the firmament in the middle between the waters. There's water above the firmament and water below the firmament. I might readily imagine that the firmament is the uppermost mass of all, and that the waters which are in suspicion, not over but under the heaven, are the clouds which we observe. And this is what you're all thinking. You're thinking, well, the firmament, the, there, there must be water. When, when Moses is talking about water, there's the clouds up there, and that's the firmament, and then there's water down here on earth, right? That's what you're thinking, but that's not what Moses is saying. Moses is saying there's a crystalline sphere out there, and there's water on the far side of that, which you cannot see, and then the waters that are underneath the firmament are the heavens that you can see. This is what he's talking about, okay? All right, I might readily imagine that the firmament is the uppermost mass of all, and that the waters which are in suspicion, suspension, not over but under the heaven, are the clouds which we observe, so that the waters separated from the waters would be understood as the clouds which are separated from our waters on the earth. No. Moses plainly says uh, that the waters were above and below the firmament. This is what he's talking about. Okay. All right. Any questions over that? It's mind-boggling, but this is, this is cosmology back in the, the, the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. So, what then? Uh, does Michelangelo do with this? And uh, what would be Luther's reaction to this? And if you take a look at this, actually, Michelangelo's pretty faithful to what's going on in Genesis here on day two. Looking at this fresco, Luther would have understood all of the action depicted as taking place below the firmament. You can't see beyond the firmament. You can't see the waters beyond the firmament. Okay, that solid band that God placed in the sky to divide the waters. Beneath this band was the blue sky of heaven, and this is clearly seen in the upper left-hand side of Michelangelo's fresco. You see it over there, right? There's heaven. This is below the firmament, the heaven below the firmament. Also beneath the firmament was still, on day two of creation, a watery, goopy mist. This is what God is going to separate, right, on day three so that the earth can be revealed, but it has not yet been separated. This was the remaining unformed water dregs, Luther called them. God would then on day three congregate these waters into oceans, seas, and rivers. And in doing this, dry land would then appear emerging out of the water. This goopy mist, Michelangelo has depicted as a white mist in this fresco. Okay? And you can see why Luther would scratch his head and say, Michelangelo, why did you put this out of order? Right? Why you had, because you know what's going on. Why did you do this? And I don't think, I, I don't know if Luther would have understood. Michelangelo's reasoning here, I want that bigger area to paint days uh, three and four or not, but you can see what he's doing right here, right? This is everything below the firmament on day two. We've got the heavens over there on the left-hand side, and we've got that mist right there on the right-hand side. Okay, any questions about that? So I think, I, I think Luther would have liked this. It, it, it goes along with what he says in his commentary on Genesis. Okay, all right. Uh, Luther's reaction to the fourth fresco depicting creation on day six. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, and the text that, he's, uh, that, Mike, uh, that, that Michelangelo is working from, Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 26, let us make man in our image and likeness. Let us make man in our image and likeness. And this is what Michelangelo, how Michelangelo has interpreted this. I think... Luther would very much have approved of Michelangelo's depiction of God being involved in the creation of Adam here. He points out in his commentary that previously, up until the creation of uh, man, 
that God had ordered the waters to produce fish and fowl. Uh, and, and, and God had ordered the earth to produce herbs. In other words, that having created things, God then ordered those elements of creation to produce something else, right? That God is working through the elements that are out there. But Luther takes tremendous satisfaction in the fact that that's not how God goes about creating man and woman. He takes tremendous satisfaction uh, in, in the passage in Genesis where God says, I am directly going to create man and woman, right? Let us, let us. We're not going to delegate this to, to, to earth or to water or anything else, but it is going to be us. We are going to go out and we are going to create uh, man himself. All right, so he would like this. He would like to have seen, you know, that there's the deity. Yes, please. Probably a little minutiae, but why are it mature? Are is a group? Oh, that is not minutiae at all. We're just going to jump all over that right now. Yeah. Um, Luther, Christian, keep in mind this is a Hebrew text. Okay, this is a Hebrew text, so let's give the Christian interpretation of that. Let's give the Lutheran interpretation of that to begin with, okay? All right, so Luther, in, 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 in good Christian uh, uh, tradition, argues right here that what is going on is that God is referring to the Trinity, right? That God, God is speaking to the Son, and He's speaking to the Holy Spirit, and He says, let us, the three of us, come together and let us create mankind. Okay, uh, and, 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 and this then... Uh, uh, Luther would have very much approved of this, uh, that Adam, the first man, uh, is being uh, created directly by, uh, directly by God. Um, because this is a Hebrew text, uh, there's a lot of discussion among the Jews themselves as to who, because they, you know, uh, the, the Jews are accused Christians of being polytheistic, that they have three gods. And so the Jews uh, somehow have to uh, explain and interpret this text, as they always have, that God must be speaking to uh, those gathered around him, to the other angels, to the cherubims, and, and, and like this. Let us, you know, let us think about this and let us create uh, a man in our image and likeness. But for Luther, this is uh, absolutely uh, the idea uh, that the Trinity is present in creation uh, in, in, in Genesis itself. Okay, uh, at the same time, as you can see, because of the way that Luther interprets this, when uh, he says, let go of God, he interprets uh, God uh, when he's saying, let us make man in our image and likeness. Again, he believes that God created man working through the variable, right? Working through the word that is working through Christ himself. And so instead of seeing just God out here physically creating, somehow he would want Michelangelo to uh, depict this so that uh, creation is actually coming through the variable. The, 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 uh, Christ himself, the variable, is somehow involved in the creation of Adam. I have to say, I'm sympathetic towards Michelangelo uh, in this depiction because when you, wrap, you, you try to wrap your mind around it, how would Michelangelo do that? Uh, and, 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 and this very dramatic creation of Adam would lose so much if you see maybe God just sitting there contemplating uh, let's create, uh, let, let, let's, let's us, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, uh, create uh, a mankind, create Adam, and somehow Adam slowly emerging out of, the, uh, out of the earth. It's going to lose its dynamic impact, but somehow that's what we would prefer, I think, much more than, than, than what we have going on right here. Okay, I also think that Luther would have very much approved of the way in which Michelangelo has chosen to depict Adam. That is, the, the, the way in which uh, this, this firstborn son of God has been depicted. Adam, the first man, was untouched by sin, was perfect mentally, physically, and spiritually. And Luther then uh, comments on this, because right, this is perfection. This is before sin has entered into the world. Now listen to what he says right here. Um, uh, the image of God, uh, the man is created in the image of God, according to which Adam was created, was something far more distinguished and excellent, since obviously no leprosy of sin adhered either to his reason or to his will. But his inner and his outer sensations were all of the purest kind. His intellect was the clearest, his memory was the best, and his will was the most straightforward. All in the most beautiful tranquility of mind, without any fear of death and without any anxiety. To these inner qualities came also those most beautiful and superb qualities of body, and of all the limbs, qualities in which he surpassed all of the remaining living creatures. 
I think he would have liked this image of my uh, of uh, Adam right here that Michelangelo has depicted because it, it, it does a fine job of showing the beauty of the human body and uh, the, 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 the sinlessness uh, of, of uh, Adam as well. All right, uh, any questions over there? Yes, please. Nick. <laughs> Number of these frescoes, how, how do we know this? They're not in order. You know? Why this one for two, this one for one? Yeah, well, um, because he's taking the. Uh, I, think, I, I think that Luther would have liked this an awful lot. Okay, moving on then. Uh, Luther's reaction uh, to the sixth fresco depicting the temptation of Eve and Adam. And here's the text that Michelangelo was working from right here. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. So we're out of the creation story, right? We're, we, we've, created, uh, we've created the heavens and the earth. We've created man, the garden of Eden, all this. And so now we're moving on to the, uh, uh, to the fall. Because if you remember, what's going on on the Sistine Chapel ceiling is God creates the world. He creates the universe, Adam and Eve, and everything is perfect. Everything is perfect. But what happens? Man and woman, Adam and Eve, sets God, and God is going to demand punishment for this. Okay, so this is what's going on. This is church theology. So the temptation, right? Luther's reaction to the sixth fresco depicting the temptation of Adam and Eve. And here's the text that uh, Michelangelo is working from. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you should not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the wily serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree, uh, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took up its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And here's how Michelangelo has envisioned that. Okay, this is, uh, you can see, uh, and actually we have two different stories going on. He's, again, this is one of those broad uh, 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 panels, and he's combined two different uh, episodes. We have the temptation of Adam and Eve over here on the left-hand side. Uh, you can see the serpent right there in the middle, and then the expulsion going on over here on the right-hand side. So we're going to concentrate here on the left-hand side to begin with, and what is uh, Luther's reaction to this. Luther, I think, would have appreciated the manner in which Michelangelo chose to portray the temptation of Eve and Adam. Michelangelo has depicted them as still possessing the beautiful bodies that God gave them when they were created. This is before sin, right? They are shown naked and unashamed of their nakedness because they were still innocent and unaware that being naked was a sin. Luther would also have approved of the dynamic that is being portrayed in the temptation of Eve and Adam. He argued in his commentary on Genesis that obedience to God's command not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was the form of worship that God had given to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, right? This was how they carried out their devotion to God, by obeying his command that do not eat from that tree. God warned Eve and Adam that to eat of the fruit of this tree would bring death upon them. And so he's actually being uh, 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 benign towards them. Don't do that. He's warning them, don't eat of that tree because if you do, you will die. They had to take this command on faith and in doing so, believe that God had given this commandment to them out of his wisdom and kindness. This is all Luther, right? This is what Luther, how Luther interprets what's going on right here. All right. Now, in, in, in um, comment, commenting on this, the temptation itself, Luther argues that Satan leaves Eve to doubt God's good will in giving them this command. He says to Eve, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And for Luther then, this was the sin of Adam and Eve, the doubting of God's work. God had said, do not do this because if you do, you will die. And Satan tempts them and says, no, God, you're not going to die, right? He plants that seed of doubt in there. And then Eve, he convinces Eve that she's not going to die. And so she doubts God and she eats of the forbidden fruit. The eating of the fruit was simply the outcome of that sin, that doubt. 
In eating of the fruit, Eve and Adam turned from faith to an unbelief in God. Michelangelo has depicted Eve succumbing to the wiles of Satan, taking the forbidden fruit from the hand of the serpent. So I think he would have, I think that uh, Luther would have liked uh, what's going on here uh, quite a bit. Any questions about that? Yes, Dick? Somehow they knew she knew life was finite. He said she wouldn't die, so she must have known there's a possibility of dying. Uh, if you transgress God. No, there was it was infinite life unless you transgress yeah. God's yeah. man. Yeah. 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 Okay. Any other questions about this? All right. So, are you all sitting down? <laughs> okay. So, the next question is, what would Luther's reaction be to Michelangelo's female serpent? Look at that serpent. Can I use the word breast? Do you see the breast on that body, on that female serpent right there? That is a female serpent. Female serpent up there tempting Adam and Eve. What would have been Luther's reaction to this depiction of that female serpent? Luther would not have been shocked by Michelangelo's portrayal of the serpent with the head and the body of a woman. Depicting the serpent as female was frequently done by artists in the later Middle Ages and into the Renaissance. And I just want to give you two quick uh, examples of that. On the left-hand side, uh, this is a fresco taken from a chapel in a church in Florence. It's by the artist Mazzolino. And I'm showing you this because Michelangelo grew up in Florence and we know that he knew of this fresco right here. But the one on the right-hand side is even more interesting. Uh, you see Eve and Adam right there uh, in the center, and to the right-hand side there's a serpent, which is a female as well. This was painted by Luther's neighbor in Wittenberg. Uh, his name was uh, Lucas Cronich, right? And this is done by Luther's neighbor. Luther obviously knew about this, the, the, the depiction of this serpent as having the head of a female. So this would not have shocked Luther. It would not have shocked Luther at all. The question is, and I'm sure you're dying to know, where in the world does this come from? Where in the world does this come from? Well, art historians have traced the origins of the female serpent, that is, a serpent with a female face, back to the commentary of a 12th century French theologian. Uh, in his commentary, he said that the face of the snake had the face of a virgin. He wasn't being malicious. He wasn't being uh, mischievous. He simply misread the original Latin text that he was commenting on. He thought that the text said that the serpent had the face of a virgin rather than what it really said, and we won't go into that, but it, it worked its way then into commentaries. Now, the reason it did was because it did not seem far-fetched, right? First of all, snakes can't talk, right? Snakes can't talk. And the idea then that providing the serpent with the face of a, the head of a female, if Satan gives the, the, the serpent the head of a female, it was going to have a mouth and therefore it could speak. Secondly, this idea that the serpent actually had a female face gained, gained traction because it seemed to be a cunning ploy on the part of Satan to trick Eve. Instead of frightening her away with the scary appearance of a serpent, Satan transformed the head of the serpent into that of another woman, right? So she wouldn't be frightened. A uh, uh, devil then could tempt her. When medieval plays were performed depicting the temptation of Eve, directors were quick to have their serpents have human heads because it allowed them to speak on stage. And usually they had young boys who with their uh, uh, prepubescent faces looked very much like a young girl and that allowed them to speak and carry on a conversation talking back and forth with Eve. Both Luther and Michelangelo were quite familiar with both of these traditions, a painted tradition as well as these plays, as were their contemporaries. This is why Michelangelo could get away with painting this serpent with a female head uh, on the Sistine Chapel ceiling. It wouldn't have bothered his contemporaries because this is what they saw all along. Luther would not have been shocked by this. Would he have liked it? I don't think so because it's not biblical. It's not biblical. He could have understood why it was up there because it's all around him. But I think Luther, you know, being a, strict, a, a stickler for scripture, I think Luther would have said it doesn't say in scripture that Satan had a female head. And so I think he would have objected to that. But he wouldn't have been shocked by it. 
Okay, any questions? Well, we're out of time. We did an awful lot today. We got through creation and we've had the fall. <laughs> but it's more to come. All right, I will see you all then next uh, Sunday. Thank you. Thank you.